Well, I'm Australian, therefore I speak the correct English. Yeah, but in the, by, by the law of relativity, someone has to have the correct English, and I've decided it's Australia, not England. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to be talking about incorporating cyber mission strategies into general missions approaches. Next slide, please. Okay, cyber missions is the application of digital ministry techniques to cross cultural missions. So, what we have at the moment is an alienation between technology and the rest of missions. So you have things like global media outreach, doing internet evangelism, you have uh, radio planning ministries, you have uh, many technology initiatives going out there, uh, people distributing hard drives and resources, uh, mobile ministry, and all these things, but they're not integrated very well into the big major missionary societies. There's not very many major missionary societies that have a cyber missions department in them or an internet evangelism department in them or a digital resources department within them. So my thinking is let's try and get the technology side and the church planting side and the discipleship side, let's get all these together so we work together as one because we're in the 21st century, technology is everywhere and I say the first touch is often a digital touch. In America, 85% of people will not go to a church unless they've checked out the website first. Right? They won't go to your seminary unless they check out your seminary website first. So your first touch is often through your website or through text or through some sort of mobile thing before they do anything else. Next, go to the next slide, please. Okay, now in technology, uh, the, clear, the key term is this thing called quality assurance. The key term in the integration of technology projects into general missions approach is quality assurance. A definition of quality assurance is quality assurance is a system for ensuring a desired level of quality in the development, production or delivery of products and services. If you don't have quality in technology, you have a mess. You have a nightmare. You spend money and it all gets burned up and it doesn't work. So we have to think about how do we do this well. Next slide. The only way to ensure a consistently good result in anything from washing the dishes to landing a rocket on, the co on a comet is with a good system. Bad systems only produce bad results. I was, uh, uh, in the 80s, I was part of a missionary society that uh, failed to computerize its records. So we were two years behind on our finances. The financial reports were two years late. We're a jungle missionary society. We had to buy our stuff with vouchers from headquarters. Money was no use in the jungle. The stress on the families was immense. And due to the failure of computerization, the missionary society exploded. The anger of the field missionaries towards the head caused it to uh, collapse because the system didn't work. When you have a bad system, you have bad results. Now, I come from a holiness background. I was a disciple by brethren, conservative Baptist, eventually ended up Bapticostal. But a lot of that is still with me, and we were told, God does not need systems, he just needs prayer. Well, you try working without a system, try doing an operation without a system, try doing anything technical without a system, and you just get a gigantic mess. So we need systems. But we don't need alienating systems, we need living systems. Every, every cell in your body is a complex organic system. And the systems in your body support life. And mission systems need to support spiritual life. And so when I want to introduce technology into evangelism, I want to support spiritual life, such as making sure technology supports the follow-up of converts or I want to make sure that technology supports the growth of house churches, cell churches, and church planning movements. So we want to develop a technological system that helps with the propagation of spiritual life. Now, uh, as the, uh, in God, we talk about kokma or wisdom. The seeking of kokma or practical wisdom, it's a Hebrew word for wisdom, and knowledge means that God teaches people the correct way to harvest and process dill and come, and that's a process, uh, or to do technical work such as building the tabernacle with Bezalel. Kokma is defined by Smend as the art of reaching, reaching one's end by the use of the right means. 
So God wants us to reach the right end by the right means in a wise way that gets wise results. Next slide. Okay. Technology is not an end in itself. Technology is just one of the means to quality. If you can produce a high quality result without technology, great, throw out the technology. <laughs> but technology is just there, for instance, to cast my voice across this room, I have a little bit of technology called a microphone. It is there to ensure a quality result. But quality is defined as producing consistently good kingdom results. Next slide. Cooperation and co technology exists alongside other kingdom activities, alongside prayer, alongside good doctrine, alongside holy living. And in this paper, we explore how technology can be integrated with general missions approaches so that together they achieve consistently good kingdom results. Next. Next slide. Okay. Okay. There are seven essentials that you need. You need vision. You need prayer on the Holy Spirit. You need trust and collaboration or else you get politics. You need a system that consistently produces good results. You need emotion and motivation in whatever you're doing. You need local ownership and you need sustainability. Next slide. Okay, here are four big concepts I want you to write down. Get your pen and paper out. I'm going to be your Bible college lecturer. All right. Number one, information is digital. You can digitize the scriptures, you can digitize a symphony, you can digitize a film. All information is digital. Secondly, impartation is spiritual. You lay hands on people, you pray for them, you baptize them, you have communion with them. So impartation is spiritual. Formation is personal. Iron sharpens iron. You have discipleship, one-on-one -on -one or small group. Formation of people is personal. And transformation is communal. That's the uh, early church in the communities there or the school of Tyrannus. They are transformational communities and transformation involves a big enough group to transform a village, a city, a town or, or, or from a Bible college. Uh, can we stay back there? Don't go ahead. Stay back there. Go back one. All right, yeah. Okay. Now, information is digital. Information is the start. If the doctrine is wrong, if the information is wrong, everything else goes wrong. But information is not enough. Right? You can give people a three terabyte hard drive full of good doctrine, nothing happens. Right? You can give out USB drives all you like, nothing will happen. Uh, you can broadcast radio signals into people, maybe something will happen, maybe it won't. You can set up websites, maybe something will happen, maybe it won't. So the information is digital, is vital, but then you have to integrate it with the other three things, which means you need small groups, it means you need, it means you need facilitators, it means you need to have that personal discipleship. Now, the personal discipleship might be over Skype. That might be your one-on-one -on -one formation as personal. You might have a digital community that's transformational, and that some of them have grown up over the years. But you need to have all these four things operating if you're going to integrate your technology, your digital information uh, out there. Now, I, just before I, I was here, I was in Cebu, and someone was going uh, off to Bangladesh. So I got a USB drive, and it was a special USB drive that has one end that goes into your computer and the other end that can go into your cell phone or your tablet, the tiny micro USB. I loaded it up with the audio Bible in Bengali and a PDF Bible. I said, here you go. You're going to Bangladesh. You can now distribute the information. You can share the Bible and the audio Bible off a USB drive, and you can give it to the pastors you're meeting. Next. Okay, so we want a complete package, not just excellent information, but impartation, formation, and transformation with information at the start of the process. Next. Okay, so we see in the Great Commission, we preach the gospel, that's information. We baptize them, that's impartation. We make disciples, that's personal formation, and they're teaching them, the community, to obey that's transformation in the church community, living out those one another commands, love one another, forgive one another, bless one another. Next slide. Okay, here's four steps. Create, deliver, train, catalyze. Well, you want to create, when you're doing digital ministry, you want to create resources that are so good that everyone wants to share them. Quality is virality. If you create something 
that's funny, it goes everywhere on Facebook, right? <laughs> if you create a good resource that's excellent, people say, that's good, I will share that, and it's in digital format, so they can put it on the end of an email, they can put it on a USB drive, they can send it to one another uh, over various digital networks, and it will travel because it has quality. So quality is virality. So an average resource will just go bloop, nothing will happen. All right, so you want a resource that real quality is in the mind of the end user. Does this meet their need? I'll give you just a very simple example. I uh, have done a lot of work on Baptic Castle, so I've done a lot of work in breaking curses and spiritual warfare. I came up with this little pamphlet that I designed, a threefold pamphlet that it was designed to be photocopied on both sides for explaining how to break curses and a prayer for deliverance, etc. That has gone out probably over a million times from my server because people download it, they photocopy it, they, and because it's a quality resource, a very simple resource, uh, it's, uh, it's, so they want a quality resource. Next step after create, next slide, please. Deliver. You need to deliver the resource to a device that people own. A little bit of a hobby horse here, please don't give people devices. Don't give them tablets, don't give them laptops, don't give them stuff, deliver it to something they already have. Most people will have a mobile phone, or of some description, even very primitive, put it on their phone, right? Get it onto the device they already have. What happens when you go out, I, this is a ridiculous example, but you'll understand it, people going around giving out uh, MacBook Airs, you know, the, the nice little MacBooks. What happens? Jealousy, fighting, squabbling because they give them to the associate pastors and the senior pastor sees the MacBook. How come you've got the MacBook and I haven't? Uh, one worker gets it, another doesn't. We have problems. You give out technology, A, you've got to maintain it, then you've got to fix it, then they say, oh, it broke, this is this problem, can you send another one? Don't give out technology. Get your resources onto technology that people already have. And there's lots of uh, things there. There's, uh, I saw someone with a Bible box uh, distributor uh, around here. That's a great tool for getting their switch on your Bible box. People can download it to their phones or their laptops. So there's multitudes of delivery methods. Okay, next. Train. After you've delivered the resource to the people, you want to train facilitators. Facilitators that know the resource, understand the resource, understand the technology, especially if you're setting up an internet cafe or something like that. Know how to facilitate a small group uh, and how to recruit group, group members. So all the digital discipleship efforts seem to get stuck at the facilitator level. Unless you have facilitators, it's no use producing the resources because information alone does not change people. Information has to be experienced as a group. So say you're into orality and you deliver audio Bibles to people, then you have to get them into an oral storying group, you have to have a good oral storying method, you have to be able to encounter the, the audio stories, you have to have those facilitators trained in how to use that resource for the kingdom. Okay, next. Catalyze. Once you've just got something going, once it's working, you want to catalyze a movement around it. You want to say, this works, try it. Have a little conference about it. Have a facilitator training conference. Celebrate your win. Once it's working, celebrate it uh, and, and get it out there and think multiplication, not addition. How can you get this resource working? How can you get this technical approach to missions working? Next slide. Okay, there's a big gap. We Westerners come over to somewhere and we have a very cool project. We're sure it's going to work. And we have our whiz-bang technology, but there's a big gap between what I think is cool and what actually works on the ground. And what's the big gap have in it? It's contextualization. Is the technology contextualized? Is it, is it uh, of the right cost? Is it sustainable? What about the capacity of the leaders and trainers that are there? Is it already being done? Is, it, is my technology idea already being done? And it, is it completely unnecessary? Is it actually required? Is it actually wanted? 
Are the people excited about it or are they just saying yes to be polite to me? Am I trusted? Is my organization trusted? So before you go into a technology project, is it really wanted? Is it in the form that people care about? Uh, and so you have to ask that question. Now this is a process I use and I'll spend a little bit of time on this slide. It's a six step process that will help you integrate technology into your missions approaches. Now remember, technology is there to support your mission statement. It's not there to do something different, it's to there to support what God has already called you to do. So, six steps, and there, it's a modified version of appreciative inquiry with some tweaks. Uh, explore, discover, dream, design, deliver, review, redo. Before you launch out into a technology initiative, explore and find out if it's already been done. Spend three or four months goofing around the internet, looking at websites, talking to other missionaries, finding out what uh, other organizations are doing it, and maybe you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Now, I have, I've seen mission agencies try to, to say, we need to invent a new document format. And I think, no, you don't. That doc document format you want already exists. You just didn't know about it. And so they spent years and years of inventing a new document format. It's a big job. I spent years and years of, of assigning missionaries to something that's already been done by someone else. Right? So there's things you need to do your research first. You need to explore around and find out uh, what's out there. And that can take some time, but please do it. Then discover the one thing that's going to make all the difference. Explore, discover. Discover the one technology breakthrough that's going to multiply your ministry and that you can do. You may say, okay, for us the thing's radio planting. We'll get these tiny little radios that broadcast for 15 kilometers and we'll set them up, FM radios, and we'll put them programming. And that's for you, that's the thing that you think you can do that supports your vision. Or it might be social media. Whatever it is, you discover that one thing. Then once you've discovered it, and you're doing this as a group, you're doing this, you're praying, dream what you can do. See that technology working in your mind. How's that going to make church planning better? How's that going to train your disciples? Dream and get that dream really clear in your mind. Then start designing. Uh, you know, who, what, when, where, how, how's it going to work? And you think through this, the design stages. Finally, you deliver that technology to the field. You deliver it to where it's a uh, thing. And then when you deliver it, you will find challenges. It's always a bug. There's always a difficulty. So you review and redo. Now, you go through this six-step process, explore, discover, dream, design, deliver, review, and redo. The big phases in the middle, dream, design, and deliver. That's the hard work of doing a technology project. So technology in your mission agency must support the vision of your mission agency, and you want to go th think through a technology project you know, very carefully. Too many people just run with the latest idea. They come to me and they say, uh, John, we want to use the internet to save the world. The internet's the thing now. Well, social media is the thing now, and we want to use the internet to save the world. That is too general. I can't help anyone with that. Uh, but if they say, we want an internet cafe in X unreached people group, and we've got 20 of these unreached people groups, and we'd like these internet cafes here, and we want a certain design, and we need certain, then I can sit with them and I can design how to deliver uh, an evangelistic internet cafe and an unreached people group that supports the missionaries. We can work on that. And it should not be alien to your mission, it should get your mission moving. Okay, so technical projects require trust, and they require a lot of trust. If you have a high trust level, what happens? High speed, low cost, zero politics. All right? If you have a low trust level, and this is all pinched from uh, 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 one of Covey, Covey's son's book, which is called Leadership at the Speed of Trust. High trust level, high speed, low cost, zero politics. Low trust level, slow, expensive, lots of politics and misery. Now, I have many stories about technology destroying trust. All right? Uh, and for instance, in security, someone says, we need all the latest security, and they come in and they have all the encryption and, and this and this and this and this. 
Right? And then you find one group that is security paranoid or whatever, and they have to have it this. And there's another group that says, oh, well, uh, God will bless us, so we don't bother about security. Uh, we're not even going to have virus checking on our computers. We're just going to trust Jesus. And believe me, that's true. I did a security workshop for WAMC in 2006 in Pattaya. I surveyed various participants and mission agencies. At that point in 2006, 25% of mission agencies had no security policy whatsoever, including even basic virus checking. Nothing. So who could trust? So the people that are nervous right, can't trust the people that have no security, and the people that have no security are taking photos and sharing it back with uh, headquarters at home, and missionaries are getting kicked out of countries like happened in uh, uh, Morocco and places like that because there's no security. So when you're doing technology, you have to start agreeing on how you're going to trust one another. And trust and technology are often very, very strongly linked. So uh, on, on security issues and also on financial issues, you're doing something like a, setting up an expensive technology project. Who's going to maintain it? Who's going to sustain it? Can you trust? And here there's, there's big issues like what happens if something breaks down? Uh, are, are you dumping something on them that they can't possibly sustain in three years' time because the computers or the UP, uh, UPSs or something are going to be need to be replaced. You're giving them this valuable ver but very expensive equipment and they're not telling you that they cannot possibly replace the stuff. Uh, and so you need to talk about that. and You need to raise lots and lots of very diplomatic trust issues. Uh, okay, we say trust, is, we've gone to another slide here. Trust is not natural. Managers don't trust engineers. Engineers never trust marketing. Technicians don't trust visionaries. I work with a lot of visionaries, and they come with these vague ideas, and, and I have to uh, be, uh, have to, to find trust somewhere within me. Intercessors don't trust accountants. Accountants don't trust IT spending, and security doesn't trust anyone else. All right. And so a lot of the best missions initiatives are done by, through partnerships, like interdev partnerships, vision synergy partnerships, uh, groups like this. And a part of that component will be a technology project, and you'll have a Bible translation project, and you'll have a livelihood project, etc. And if you order to do these kingdom technology projects, you need to spend bulk time building trust before you even get into your launching your technology thing. So, for instance, uh, say you want to set up a radio station, an FM radio station in a particular area. Uh, you just don't, you, you need a lot of conversations about that. Uh, do we trust one another? Is the technical team, how's, who, who's developing the programming for it? Uh, how's that going to work? How are you going to contextualize it? Uh, do, does the technicians feel good about the missions leadership? Do the mission leadership feel good about the radio technicians? There's a lot of conversations you need to have to have a happy time with technology. Now, who, just a quick survey, who's had a miserable experience of technology? Who's had times when technology has just left you burned? You sworn you'll never do another technology project again. I've had a few of those, and I've been doing technology projects for over 25 years. So there's times when I've sworn off it because it can go bad so easily, and these trust issues are core uh, to that. Okay, so you have to deliberately create trust if you're integrating technology into your mission society. Train those you trust, trust those you train, and be vulnerable to one another's strengths. Okay, so train those you trust. If you're doing a technology project and you're training people in the technology, find trustworthy, faithful people and train them. Now, go back. You're going ahead. Okay. Okay. Train those you trust, trust those you train. Once you've trained them, you give the technology over to them. Uh, when I was here, in, uh, set up, I set up the Asian Internet Bible Institute. I did not even have signing authority on my own checks on my own mission agency. I gave it totally over to local leadership. Once I trusted them, it was given to them. 
And then we need to be vulnerable to one another's strengths. So the person who's in management needs to trust the technical person when the technical person says, that can't be done. We can't do that, or we need this. The, the, the technical person has to trust the person in management when the management says, we want this to do this in this area. And so management sets the objectives, they set where, they set where it's going to be deployed, they set the budget, and the technical people have to trust that. So we have to say, you're strong at this point, and so I trust your strong point. And, and someone else said, because we all have different strengths, so we'd be vulnerable to one another's strengths. So I have a tech guy working for me who's absolutely brilliant, and he understands a lot more about certain hardware aspects than I ever will. I trust Bob. I say, Bob, just make that happen. I will trust you to get that to happen because you're smarter than me on the hardware aspects. So when you're on a technology team, you'll have uh, interface things, uh, you'll have programming, you'll have graphics, you'll have hardware considerations and so on, and you've got to trust one another to make the technology work. Okay, uh, I think this is the last slide, then I'm going to go back to something. To create trust, you have to deliberately be kind, humble, a good listener, ethical, reliable, non-confrontational, wise, demonstrate competence, keep your word, spend face-to-face -face time together, have written agreements, and start with small wins. The basic pr principles of collaboration that I'm sure that everyone in the room knows. Uh, but uh, if you've been to any of the interdef things, they go over them uh, over and over again. But so when we're coming to technology being integrated into the, the life of your missions agency, uh, let's go back a few slides, a lot of slides actually, to the six things that I was doing before. There, stop. Okay. This is the key. These six things here are the key to making it happen for you. You have to go through that process or a process very similar to it and think about it as a as a carefully integrated system that you're developing that's going to support your goals. Uh, you're, most people start with design. They want to do something and they forget about explore, discover and dream and they just start with design. We're going to design a new website, we're going to design a new technical outreach, we're going to put all our resources up on Facebook and a, a Facebook group and, everyone's going, and we just design. But without the preliminary steps, you will get moved very quickly away from what your organisation's about and you'll head into spending far more money than you need. Uh, my boast is I can do your project for 1% or 0.1% of what you think you could, you're going to spend on it. I've had $100 million projects that I can do for $10,000 that other people have spent $100 million on. Uh, I, because they don't think about what their objective is. They throw a lot of money uh, at something without really saying, well, this is the objective. And I say, well, there's a much simpler way to get to that objective, this way, and I go around the back. Uh, and so the, uh, if you explore, discover, and dream, maybe your pro project isn't needed, maybe it's already been done, and you just have to point to something else. Uh, and so there are ways of doing things so that those first three steps, don't jump over them or you will burn megabucks. Now let, let me again uh, have a little personal whinge. Don't develop apps. Mobile apps? Why? Because you, you develop your app, it looks bright and shiny, you, spend, you, you, you tell someone to develop and they hit you for five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars to develop your app. And then, of course, it gets a bug. Uh, how are you going to support the app? How are you going to support the software? Most mission agencies have two or three people working on the app or the software. And one of them gets sick, the other one leaves the mission agency, the other one, the third remaining person gets overburdened or reassigned, and a lot of the most creative people get put into some uh, business development area or something like that, and suddenly there's no one supporting your software, your software becomes buggy, it becomes unsafe, it becomes a catastrophe. Uh, and so software development and app development 
it looks great for two years, third year it's horrible, fourth year, uh, well, we're not using it anymore, fifth year it's a disaster. Uh, and so most missions technology initiatives that aren't thought, thought through fail in about three years. It's over, it's done, we had this and it didn't work. So you need to do those first three things and think about does this integrate with your thing and do you have the people and the funds to support it and to sustain it? Uh, because otherwise you'll end up writing code, writing new things, doing new software, a lot of which is already out there. If you'd done the exploration, you wouldn't have had to spend the money in the first place. So these six steps will help you as an agency to, to achieve harmony and bliss. Uh, you will find yourself a lot happier if you take time. The other thing I want to uh, bring up, uh, how many minutes have I got left? Five? Okay. The, the, the uh, other thing I, w I want to bring up is that you want to intentionally make technology part of your world. You need to be conscious about technology. You be, need to, like you need to be conscious about your money. Once you become conscious about your money and your spending, you can control it. You need to be conscious about where technology fits. And if you look at where technology fits in today's missions world, and you start seeing technology for the first time, whether it's as simple as a microphone or the MAF plane you fly in, uh, there's not much you can do in a church without technology. If the electricity goes off, church goes off in most places, right? So the, there's a lot of little factors in technology and you need to think, technology is part of missions. How can you do it well? How can you achieve quality? How can it support and deliver good kingdom results for you? And once you've thought that through, it becomes just a natural part of the flow of what you're doing. It's not something separate. It's not something just for young people. It's something that is part of your, the, the DNA of what you are. And once technology becomes part of you, part of your DNA, part of something that you deploy to get a result, then it becomes friendly and harmonious and you actually like it. While it's out there and it's for young people and it's alien, it just becomes a source of irritation. So think about these six steps. Think about the four things I said earlier. Uh, Information is digital, impartation is spiritual, formation is personal, uh, and uh, transformation is communal. Think about those uh, and see how you can apply that in your agencies and you will uh, have a good experience with technology and you'll multiply your ministry. Thank you. God bless.